on the season finale of America's Next Top Model. Seven modes started the journey. Now, only three remain. Phrygian. Aeolian. One of them will be crowned the winner. If they can handle the pressure. I didn't come here to make friends. You're such a phony. I'm the natural miner. Flat thirds. Mixolydian, Aeolian, and Phrygian. Three beautiful modes stand before me, but I will only call one name. The modes whose name I do not call must immediately go back to the studio, pack up your intervals, and go back home. Mixolydian. Mixolydian, you have come so far from just jazz and blues. Now, you're everywhere. We've seen you in Royals by Lord, Sweet Home Alabama, and Clocks by Coldplay. You've been the centerpiece of every 20-minute jam band song. But some of the judges are put off by your ubiquity. Some of the judges think you're great, but is it too much? Aeolian. The judges think you are so, so sad. And so, so serious. And they like it. No other mode can convey emotion like you do in Losing My Religion or in Phil Collins in the Air Tonight. But some of the judges think, is that all Aeolian can do? What if Aeolian just smiled for a change? And finally, Phrygian. The judges love your exotic nature. You can take us where no other mode can take us. But the flat two is a little off-putting for the general public. The very thing that makes you unique and special is what challenges your listeners the most. So, who goes home? Is it the mode that's good, but a bit overused? The mode that's very good at one thing, but hasn't broken out of their box? Or the mode that the judges appreciated, but that still struggles to go mainstream? The winner of America's next top modal is this modal. What happened? Hey, what do you do? Come on, man. Oh, come on. 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 in the Wong Notes. I'm Corey Wong. Today's theme is the future. When I think of the future, I like to have a positive outlook. So here are my hopes for the future. Okay, here goes. Who are you? I'm you from the future. A dystopic nightmare where every science fiction movie franchise becomes reality. Corey, you are the key to humanity's redemption. Recognize the depth of your darkness before it's too late. What are you talking about, man? Your reckless confidence blinds you. Haven't you questioned why the second season of Corey and the Wong Notes has been riddled with drama? 
why you lost your sponsors, why you accidentally fired your best friend, while you received such vitriolic YouTube comments. Those were just character building trials and tribulations that I inevitably- No! It was your clone, Evil Corey. He's been wreaking havoc this whole time. That's right. It was me the whole time. I really kind of wanted to lean into the singer-songwriter mandolin part of stuff. And then we go, oh. All right, where's Pitar? I didn't say Pitar, I said Peter. Future Corey, how dare you warn good me of evil me? You're ruining the perfectly horrible timeline that I've crafted over decades. Prepare to die. Stop! I don't believe that anyone is pure evil or pure good. The future is what we make of it. And in this moment, I choose love. The future has changed. Humanity is restored. Thanks to you, good Corey and evil Corey. Actually, no. Thanks, Corey and other Corey. Bye. Well. Can I be Cory and you be other Cory? Fine. Yes. <laughs> Two, three, go! Do you wanna go?
In the world of music law, one justice has the final word. The Honorable Judge Corey Wong presiding. He decides who is wrong and who is wrong. Miss Rachel, since the end of your friendship with Mr. Daniel, you are seeking full custody over your bandmates, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. It says here you recruited them from your summer camp, so they were your friends first. And you also provide a weekly rehearsal space at your parents' garage? Hold on a second, how old are you guys? Uh, 17. Are you even allowed to be here? Where are your parents? Okay, look, whatever. Mr. Daniel, what is your contribution to the band anyways? I came up with our name, Punky Groovester. I also do all our social media and play the drums. Objection, your honor, uh, he plays a drum machine. And that's if he actually shows up to rehearsals. Mr. Daniel, how often do you miss rehearsal? Just the past few, 15 or so. 15? 15 rehearsals you missed? Your Honor, I'm in several fantasy sports brackets. The only thing I'm guilty of is having too many friends. I still make every show. And you probably spend most of it out back vaping with the opening band. I wonder, Miss Rachel, at these shows, is this drum machine even plugged in? No, we use a backing track. It's more reliable. What? I never knew that. Which is further proof that you are an absentee band member. I rule in favor of the plaintiff. Miss Rachel, you are wrong. Mr. Daniel, you are wrong. Miss Rachel, I grant you full custody over the entire band and its respective social media logins. Daniel, evacuate all of your gear from the rehearsal space immediately. Next! Hey, what's up? I am here with my good friend, Joey Dosick. Joey, thanks for being here. My pleasure, man. Excited. We both reference a lot of music from different eras. A lot of your music, a lot of my music, there's elements of growing up in the 90s, 2000s. There's elements of our biggest influences from 70s, 80s, 60s. What era do you feel like you fit in the best? Do you feel like you fit in the modern era or do you feel like you would have fit better at some other time? I mean, I don't, I don't have a choice. You know, it's like, <laughs> we're just here. Yeah. And so I feel like the constant battle or the challenge uh, that I like to embrace with production is, okay, even if it is referencing another era, oftentimes it's, well, how do I bring something modern? Sometimes it's a production yeah. tool or sometimes it's a lyrical tool. Yeah. Lyrics are different. So yeah. it's, oh, that's always the challenge for me. It's like, how do you bring something that's just today into it? Yeah. You know, sometimes it's just the fact that it's being made today. Yeah. It's just recording technology is way different. We're not normally all just recording onto tape using, if you go far back using one mic or two mics or four mics or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I guess and it, it'd be fun to imagine a reality where we were living in the 60s and 70s, <laughs> the golden era, you know, and all sure. recording with the greatest musicians who ever lived and putting out the music in that context. But for now, we don't really have a choice. That's absolutely true. At least at this point. I have this friend who said that he built a time machine from high school, this kid that's nuts. And when we were in college, he literally bought a crystal from this guy on the internet for ten thousand dollars. That the, the dude, how'd that turn out for him? Unfortunately, he's not traveling through space and time, and he's out ten grand. Oof! This is an early dark web. Oof! Untraceable. I don't. I don't remember what the method was. It was some sort of wire transfer thing, but that that hurts. That's hurtful. Yeah, so you're We're already right. traveling through space and time. 
That's deep. Woo. I like that. <laughs> That's deep. Well, there's something about your voice, though, that to me feels old school. Beyond yeah. just like, oh, like, you know, like the Game Winner EP feels vintage to a certain degree, maybe a little more so than Inside Out. And like, of course, some of that is production techniques, writing techniques, whatever. But your voice definitely has a feeling that's unique to not, I mean, it is unique to this time because it doesn't sound like a lot of other singers to me, but also your saxophone playing, your keyboard playing, there's so many things about it that feel like, like it reminds me of a time that I, where I didn't even exist, you know, it right. like brings me back to old records or something. What do you think you attribute that to? I feel like in my musical development, I probably went through all these phases where I just zeroed in on a specific style or time period. So yeah. for me in high school and early college, it was about jazz from 1955 to 1970. Mm. And it was just like pretty much anything else didn't matter that much. Sure. Except for like outcast. You yeah. Know what I mean, like I got <laughs> like that yeah. still, but I was just super focused on just being a total jazz nerd. Yeah. And then after that, I kind of reverted to what I had been into when I was a kid, which was more of sort of like classic R&B records and mm. stuff. And so I zeroed in on, okay, I want to learn every great Stevie Wonder tune ever yeah every song on the what's going on record like, yeah why is that so special i guess it's probably just this hyper focused study of a certain time period um at a very sort of foundational point in my life foundational point of music yeah education for myself but since then i feel it's it's sort of been expanding where i, I still do get hyper focused about a certain kind of music like prints for example like yeah i'm getting into prints and just like but I think what you learn at certain points in your life, like for me, that was just a really important time of growth. And yeah, so it just stuck with me like, oh, uh, I spent a hell of a lot of time with Sam Cooke's voice or Marvin Gaye's voice, just trying to listen to what that was and yeah. approximate, you know, that feeling or something. Yeah. And it was when I was taking a, a, a step as a student, I guess. Yeah. So a lot of people think about emulating people's licks, songwriting style, that sort of thing, note choices, chord choices. We as instrumentalists, of course, that's something. But vocally, there's somewhat of a limited range of what you can do tonally. So for you, how did you find the tone of your voice? Like, because the, the uh. way that you sing to me, it's, it's, of course, it feels like Joey, but it, it is also kind of different than the way that you talk. In the same way, like for me, when I sing, I'm not a great, like, real lead singer. So I have a specific thing that I can do that's like Kermit the Frog meets Ringo, you know, and, and I feel like that, like, like that has something unique for me to sing. Oh, it's But it's great. very different than my speaking voice. Right. Like, to some degree. Right. Where you found your tone as a singer where did you kind of draw that from and what kind of spectrum did you explore before you found kind of the way that you sing? Right. I think I did it similarly to what I did on saxophone, which was on saxophone, I was always into the tone of Arthur Blythe, Albert Eiler, John Coltrane, Eric Dolphy. There's a bunch of that I'm forgetting. What yeah. I would do is I would play along with their records, right? Mm -hmm. So then when I became a singer, or I was always a singer, but when I started taking singing seriously, yeah, the thing that helped me the most in finding my own sound was learning songs and singing along with records and singers that I liked who had a similar vocal range to me. Yeah. So for me, it was Bill Withers. Bill Withers mm. has like yeah, totally. the same thing. And I don't think I sound like Bill Withers, but it definitely helped me find my own inspiration and my own sort of resonance i guess you could say by just yeah. being able to sing along with a great song the great artist yeah that was inspiring something you, and something you could do over and over again and this is, goes to a music theory thing like beatles records and singing each part 
you know, trying to sound mm. like John, trying to sound like Paul, trying to sound like George, yeah. trying to sound like Ringo even. You t- started talking about like emulating licks or whatever. Yeah. I think it was just kind of like finding a range that is comfortable or a little uncomfortable and stretching yourself. You know? Sure. You're an, a multi-instrumentalist. When I was first introduced to you, Theo was telling me about you when we were first hanging. Well, because we met, actually, I met you the same day as I met uh, Jack and Joe and Theo. We were on tour. Yes. And, and we, we went out to that breakfast yeah. joint the next morning in <laughs> yeah. Minneapolis. Yeah. I think Tomek was there too. Was Tomek playing guitar? Yeah. We yeah. were all on tour. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember at the time, Theo, because I was closest with him out of that whole group at the time, he was telling me, oh, dude, Joey's such a great saxophone player and blah, 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 and blah, 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 and this and this. And I knew that you had all this other stuff, but for whatever reason, I had this idea that you're sax guy. And when you and Theo were roommates in college, you were a saxophone major? Sax guy. You were sax yeah. guy. <laughs> yeah, you were, Yeah, you, you know, you, you could have had this path and probably at one point had your identity as sax guy. <laughs> Absolutely. And I remember hanging at your old place off Alvarado. Mm-hmm. Where was that? Yeah, in North, Al- North Alvarado, yeah. yeah. Yeah, One of the first times we were just kind of hanging out, just the two of us, and you were showing me maybe your first EP or something when you were like, hey, I'm going to start singing and playing keyboards a lot more and writing songs and doing this. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, that's really cool. I wonder what that must be like to identify yourself as one thing and then completely shift it, like sax guy to singer songwriter, Rhodes Worley, you know, thing. What was that transition like for you in the creative shift, identity shift? What was that experience like for you? My identity was inside, even though I was sax man. Yeah, was uh, I always loved to sing and I loved to write, and it felt like inside that was. That was my identity, you know? Yeah. Um, I sort of had this alter ego of like jazz nerd, you know, and I went deep into it. Yeah. um, And it taught me so much. And I'm still jazz nerd. Yeah. It was basically just taking a leap. Yeah. Just being like, okay, like, I think I'm going to shift my focus and try this other thing. Yeah. You know, like a million people do. Like we, we all, it's. We all have songs. For me, it was just this. If I don't give this a chance, I will regret it. Yeah. If I don't just see what I have. Because I always knew that I could sing and I could see that my voice had an effect on some people. Yeah. So I was like, okay, that's some positive feedback. Like, I'm just going to jump off the cliff and see, you know, see if this comes through for me. And little did I know that (laughs) once you jump off the cliff and land, then there's more and more cliffs yeah, constantly yeah. <laughs> creatively to jump by ne- it's never ending what has been the most fulfilling moment for you musically so far that's a big question uh and i feel like my answer is going to be a little bit hallmark cardi sure um but the most fulfilling moment is continuously the moment where i feel like i kind of find a song and and like fulfill the vision for it, you know, it's like, I could point to a show here. Like I could point to us playing MSG. Yeah. Like that was incredible. Or I could point to the time I got to play with Prince once, Mm -hmm. you know, and those were incredible. But the thing that really gets me the most excited and the thing that I keep chasing is not only like fulfilling the vision of the song, making it real, yeah, just making it real and making it something that I actually like for a brief moment in time, you know? Yeah. Fulfillment, it's such a different thing than success. And a lot of people confuse the two where it's like, if you're successful, you must be fulfilled in what you're doing. And, you know, conversely, when you're fulfilled in doing what you do, the success is never really attached to that. Like if somebody's, like I have a, a good friend who does a lot of acting in LA. Like he's in a bunch of commercials and things like that. And he was saying, all my friends back home think, oh my gosh, dude, you're living the dream. You're crushing it. He's like, well, yeah, like I'm in Super Bowl commercials and Pepsi commercials and whatever, but I'm just kind of 
peddling a product for this company. I'm not really telling stories. Mm. Like, yeah, there's some level of success to it, but it's not the most, like, that's not the really fulfilling thing for me. And sometimes those things converge together. I think for us sharing that moment at MSG, no doubt, a, it, it's a sign of success when you get to play and sell out venues that large. But there was a very fulfilling factor of we're all coming together. I remember arm in arm, you know, everybody huddling up before the gig thinking, this is really fun. Like thinking back to the first real gig of like the touring era of Wolfpack. <laughs> yeah, what was that? It's First Avenue. No way. It was First Avenue. Was it really? That was the first like going on tour. Like, you know, to me, a wow. run is like three shows in a row. Yeah. The fall before we did like a few nights at Brooklyn Bowl and then there was a couple Europe shows. But that's like a, a little run of shows here and a yeah. little run of shows there. The, the first year where we like really went on tour, Minneapolis, Chicago, Ann Arbor, LA, San Francisco, Denver, Portland, some festival at the Gorge. And then later we did New York and then a whole Europe run. But the, that was like the first big tour. And the first show was First Avenue. Wow. Hometown what a, show. What a place me. to kick it off, man. I know. And that was a really special moment. I remember thinking back then, like seeing Jack's vision and what, you know, hearing him talk about what it was. I don't think any of us thought that we'd get to the point to where it was. And then huddling up before the gig in MSG, there was a, a connection of success and fulfillment. What do you think the biggest misconception is for people that aren't creatives or artists or musicians? What do you think the biggest misconception is about success versus fulfillment? I can't talk about other fields from any kind of place of authority. Like if you, uh, all I could talk about is a creative field Yeah, and me personally. And I think being in the creative field for me and my experience, it's been a constant balance of feeling the weight of crippling self-doubt. Yeah. You know, and that to me can have a real effect on your quality of life. Yeah. You know, especially if your name is like plastered on the thing. Yeah. Because if you feel like, I mean, it takes a while for the, the work to get to where you want it to go. Yeah. Like anybody in any field, it's like to get something good, it takes blood, sweat and tears. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of that process is just oftentimes very real, sweaty, thick <laughs> moments of yeah. self-doubt. Yeah. It's just kind of like knocking on, knocking on the door, looking at you in the mirror. And so that to me is in my own personal uh, journey has been the thing that gets the most in my way of fulfillment. Mm. You know, it's like, do I really have to wait until the end of this thing to, to get that fulfillment? Do I really have to wait until that MSG show to get fulfillment? Or can I just be a bit kinder to myself? Mm. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the journey that I'm on. It's like, okay, well, and the thing that I need to work on and probably a lot of artists do. It's yeah. like, how can I just be a bit kinder to myself during this process? Yeah. I think a lot of people in creative fields have, have that, uh, similarity. The fact that we started the whole journey off at First Avenue to me is makes so much sense. Sure. Like to get the blessing of that <laughs> venue. And yeah. I like, I don't know how you feel about this, but it, this might have been the magic, but I remember sound checking in there with no people in there. We were really hearing the room yeah. and being like, damn it, this sounds like a Prince record. Yeah. Like the drums sound like industrial almost. <laughs> I'm like, this sounds like this. I'm like, this sounds like a Prince record. Yeah. You know? And I mean, Prince, what, Purple Rain? Is it Purple Rain that yeah. does have something yeah. that's recorded it's there. at yeah. and First recorded Avenue? There, yeah. The movie filmed there. And there were certain tracks that were recorded yeah. there, right? 
anyway, that that room has real magic, and that place is that place is like anointed. The person who was operating the audio truck for that recording session, I talked to the cat. He was saying "Purple Rain" from the album. When they recorded that there, it's one of the songs from that recording where the whole audience isn't just going nuts the whole time because they didn't know the song. Right. It was a brand new song. There was an interesting air in the room of like, oh, what is this? Right. And intrigue, but also a tension of like, oh, I, I don't know what this is. I want to sing along, you know? So it is, it's interesting. That room has so much history and it almost feels like when you hear that venue name, when you think about First Avenue, you think about a sound. Right. You know, so with this song that we did as First Avenue, it felt like, oh, there's kind of only one real way to treat this production-wise, writing-wise. What do you think? Is there any other venues that are like that? I'm trying to think of. MSG, I mean, not to sound like that. Well, you know, MSG. <laughs> we got to play MSG, and um, that room sounded really good. Yeah. It's funny to I call it a room. Yeah. But when it comes down to it, it is, you know, it's just a space. Yeah. And when we were on stage, I remember just thinking, sounds good in here. Yeah. And I mean, the history of, you know, people who have played that, that place, it doesn't really necessarily have a sound though, I guess. Like you said, maybe this is a weird reference, but maybe like Cafe Wa yeah, in yeah. New York, yeah. you know, where it's like, okay, this is like a cafe venue showcase for like song for songwriters sort mm. of you know the the history of like Joni Mitchell and Bob Dylan and yeah. Jimi Hendrix and yeah like in that room I've never been there so maybe yeah. I'm, maybe I'm it's a little different now, it, but yeah, I yeah. I, as I, as you're answering I was trying to think of other things that felt like when you say the place you hear what it sounds like Village Vanguard I, I was thinking of Village Vanguard I was thinking, but that to me, I don't associate it with any specific band. Mm. It's more like that New York high energy jazz right here. The people are really close. The musicians are close. Totally has a sound. Vanguard. Right. I also, for whatever reason, my brain went to George Benson at Hollywood Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I think there's like a, I think it's because he has... <laughs> Like uh, maybe one of the better selling live albums of all time. I've never heard that album. It's it's live at Hollywood. But Bowl I've been to the Hollywood Bowl dozens and dozens of times. Yeah. So your experience at the Hollywood Bowl is much wider than mine, where I'm I associate it with that. It has a sound though. Most people, when they think of Carnegie Hall, they would think of something more classical. But there's like this old Andre Crouch gospel live from Carnegie Hall that. Oh wow. When I hear that, and then I listen to other Carnegie albums, I'm like, oh, that sounds like that room. Mm. It's interesting. Yanni live at the Acropolis. Dude. <laughs> yeah, how about that room, huh? Another Minneapolis cat. No. Yeah. Yanni? Yanni, dude. I would assume that Yanni is from, like, a mythical island nation that, you know... On Lake Minnetonka. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. no, an island, an island off of Lake Minnetonka. No, I, I don't know where in Minneapolis or Twin Cities. I think he maybe went to the University of Minnesota. Even what? Yeah, is that, he? So Yanni's Yanni's American. I can't speak to that, but I know that he has deep Minnesota. Like when people talk about Yanni, they're oh yeah, he's a Minnesota dude. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah. What if what if Prince was like ghostwriting Yanni? Is that a possibility? It was massive. Yanni was massive. I could see that. Prince wrote for a lot of people, and I don't think Yanni would be outside of that realm. If you're born after 1990, I don't think you know who Yanni is. Right? I don't know. I just remember Yanni because I would go to Laker games, and they would have, like, advertisements for Yanni. Yeah, I remember seeing all the advertisements for Yanni. I remember everything about it. I can't remember anything that he sounds like other than it's like, oh, he's new age. Right. Or like maybe definitive, him and Enya were definitive of new age. I was about age. to say, if like Enya and John Tesh had a baby in Greece, like- That was what that, Yanni really that, was? That would be Yanni. I gotta try to seek him out. <laughs> I gotta see if he's like- Actually, he's in the Smooth brand. 
for sure. Really? He's, oh, he's smooth adjacent for sure. Smooth new age. Yeah, actually, yeah. He's he's niche smooth. In a post Idris Muhammad world, Dude. where the drums became <laughs> digi, and the vibe became spiritual leader as yeah, 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 yeah. he's king and smooth adjacent. Very much so, I think. Dude, he's a tour with a full orchestra. That's gangster. It's completely gangster. That's gangster. All right. My <laughs> last question for you is, let's take 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, 20s, 30s. 20s, is where we're oh, at now. Okay, okay. And then we're just going to talk about the future. Ooh. You get to pick one thing to be a part of your of your next album. Just some imaginary album that you're going to make. You get to steal anything from the 60s. 70s, 80s, 90s, wow. 2000s, 10s, 20s, and then just the future. One from each decade. I'll, I'll, oh, go, I'll go with you too. Okay, great. So Let's we're starting with the 60s. Starting with the 60s? I think the 60s, you got to take, I would take the... Um, all of the gear, like rec- mm. all, all of the gear. That 60s is like okay, my you're golden taking gear. Gear, gear era. So uh, I want all the microphones, all the preamps, all the boards, all the compressors, all the yep. tape machines, all the rooms. I, that's what I want. I want gear. Okay. 1960s, I am taking George Martin. Ooh. I'm bringing George Martin from the 1960s. I'll go as late as I can. I'm going to go December 31st, 1969. I'm bringing George Martin back. Great. George Martin in the M-Box. Let's yep. go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to take the M-Box oh, from yeah. the early 2000s. So okay. I'll keep that in my current gear. Okay. Okay, 70s. What are you taking? 70s, I want the, the studio musicians. I want like the entire cast of studio musicians from the 70s. James Jamerson still, pl- still playing music yep. at that point. Um, Purdy, Purdy, Gadsden, like the whole Motown yeah. crew, the like sort of late gen, the wrecking crew. Yeah, I want like late later wrecking crew vibes. Yeah, sort of like um, stuff. Gad. Oh yeah. T. Yeah. Um, the Swampers. See, I was just gonna go Purdy, but you took them all. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. Since you took all the studio musicians, I can't go back in time and take them. So Purdy's off the table. I'm going to go ahead then, uh, since I have George Martin, I would say Donald Fagan and Walter Becker, but I think they're going to probably explode my budget a little too much. They're notorious for uh, right. taking a little too long. So I'll take the gear from the 70s then. There you go. You the studio go musicians wrong. are all go gone. Their instruments are still there. I'm taking those. Can't go wrong. A few less tubes, but you're, yeah, you're going to yeah, be, yeah. be great. Maybe a little more reliable second gen on a lot of those instruments. Yeah. Okay, 80s, what are you taking? 80s, I want to take all of the sort of like classic, I don't even know their name, songwriters. The people people that are writing those Pat Benatar songs. Yeah. People that are back there just just crank. Dang it. The 80s is so full of just incredible songs that are like hidden in... Like production styles that at the time were really futuristic. But if I get to get the 80s songwriters, I also get to get Prince. It's yeah, I know, because he's one of the so Yeah, he's I'm, one of the guys, you know. Dang, dude, I shouldn't have let you go first. <laughs> yeah, I really kind of like, I'm, I'm creating the dream team here. All right, so for 80s, I'm going to take the guitar solos. Ooh. It's kind wow. of the golden era of the guitar solo. <laughs> yeah, that's going to serve you well. Well, where it was really like celebrated. We love guitar right. solos on the radio. Like, right. where's the guitar solo? Right. Like, you, you hand in a record to the label, and where's the guitar solos? <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll take that That's as a guitar serve player. You. That's going to yeah, serve yeah, you. Yeah. All right, 90s, what are you taking? 90s, I'm taking all of the, uh, I'm taking all the drum machines. Ooh, okay. I'm taking all the drum machines in the 90s. So taking MPCs. This might be this might be where I made a mistake because you can simulate this later on, but um, you know the SP twelve hundred, yeah, yeah, like going for going for that sound, you know, taking all the drum machines, the samplers, yeah. That's nice because that doesn't interfere with what I was thinking. 
let me get your opinion on this. I was either going to take MTV. To me, the 90s is a golden era of MTV. I like that. Late 90s, that was my babysitter. MTV. Yeah, absolutely. But you know I'm a 90s alt rock kid. So I'm going to take all the 90s alt rock bands. You're going to take the angst? I'm going to take the bands. <laughs> okay, so great. Anybody who's on the alt rock stations, which at the time would include Red Hot Chili Peppers, it would still include Jamiroquai. And then wow. all the classic ones you'd think of. Third smashing, Eye Blind. Yeah, Third Eye Blind, late 90s. You'd get Stone Temple Pilots, Smashing Nirvana. Pumpkins. Nirvana would be in there. You'd get Weezer. That's nice. So I'm actually going gonna, gonna to take all the 90s alt rock bands. That's fantastic. Bush. <laughs> Bush. Dude, Gavin and I go back. Is that, all gl right. is that glycerin? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, man. glycerin. You're swallowed. way deeper into that stuff than I than I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. glycerin was on my radar. Amazing version, MTV Spring Break glycerin. There was a typhoon coming through Florida. Gavin Rosdale stayed out there, played. They're yelling at him. He's gonna get electrocuted. Kurt Loader's reporting on MTV, like, like you know, like he's a sportscaster. Gavin Rosdale still out there. He's going to get hit by lightning. He could die at any moment. But it was like the most rock star right. thing. He's like playing a ballad on an electric guitar and singing all hard. I remember that. Oh. I remember that. Yeah. That, that moment will stick with me the rest of my life. I wasn't there. I watched it on TV. Yeah. But for whatever Your reason, babysitter. it was that. Yeah. That was my moon landing. <laughs> that's, a little, man, that's a little bit overstatement. <laughs> like, your parents are like, I remember where I was when the, yeah. <laughs> all right. 2000s, what are you taking? Taking Outcast. I love it. 2000s, I am taking. Well, you think I'm going to explain my Outcast thing because Outcast, you have the perfect combination mm -hmm. of Andre and Big Boy. Andre, not only can he give you the lyrics and the flow, he can also give you the melody and the voice. And then mm. Big Boy, fully abstract hooks for days with Andre. So. Outcast is going to combine with this 80s writing team and just be very foundational and bring that sort of like Southern flair. I'm going to take, Jack's got his holy trinities of whatevers. I'm going to take my holy trinities of singer-songwriter guys with acoustic guitars <laughs> of the early 2000s. <laughs> to me, okay, Dave Matthews, John Mayer, Jason Mraz. <laughs> <laughs> That's the three things I'm pulling from the 2000s, dude. That's wow. my. Wow. If I had those three up front, see, and then Jack Johnson, though, can I can I leave him behind? No, I got to take Jack. Wow. I'm taking the four, <laughs> dude. <laughs> All right, moving on. Now, our aesthetics have really, <laughs> yeah, we've really, we've yeah, really, we've really diverged. Well, they're yeah. gonna work really well with George Martin. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 2010s, wow. 2010s. What do you got? Hmm. Okay, 2010s, I'm taking um, Jack Stratton Ooh. to be the sort of uh, nice. visionary nice of grad. this musical vision. He, I like yeah, that. He would know exactly what to do with all that. The 2010s, he, he dominated. I'm taking Jack Stratton's vision, someone who's going to know what to do with the music, on the gear, level. the players, oh, yeah. the drum machines from... <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Similar similar vibe. I was going to take Steve Jordan. Ooh. 2010's Steve nice. Jordan. A lot of experience. He's played with everybody at this point. He's produced everybody at this yeah. point. He's going to help also. Between him and George Martin, that's just going to... That's it's a gonna that's a, a power that's yeah. that's a power couple right there. And Steve yeah. also just naturally will be able to fill in the gaps for literally anything that I that I need. Absolutely. That's a good, that's a good grab right there. 2020s. So this could be minor future. Okay. And it could be anything in the last few years. There's one that I'm saving for the future. The 2020s have been strange so far, haven't they? We spent a lot of time at home. Mm -hmm. So maybe what I'll say for 2020s is just the ability to get stuff done at home. That's mm. going to be what I'm taking. The ability to both technologically and uh, energy-wise 
get what you need to get done without going to a studio. Writing, recording, yeah. sending emails, you yeah. know, keeping in touch with, with your friends, family, and people you work with, you know. Yeah. That's that's so far what 2020's brought. And none of the bad stuff. None of that stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. We didn't take anything of the industry. Maybe we should have taken vinyl sales from one of the <laughs> CD sales from the 90s. Dang it, oh. dude. All right. Can't I'm going to go say back. 2020s. I'm taking top 40 radio. What is top 40 radio in 2020, man? That's, so you're taking Olivia Rodrigo. I'm, I'm taking Olivia. Like, I'm, talk, I'm taking Taylor Swift. Katy Perry. I love Katy Perry's music. Right on. Okay. I love Katy Perry. Okay. That Migos. includes Migos. I get Maroon 5. I still get Weezer. I get Weezer in two eras. Weezer has songs on top 40 right now? They had uh, that Toto. Oh, they, right, they right, 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 right. They have a couple songs off the new album. All my favorite songs are slow and sad or something. Um, it means I get Beyonce. Okay. It true. means I get. Wow. Okay. Billie Eilish. You, so, you, so you took a. Uh, you know, a, a major hall there. Of well, you got all stars. the studio musicians. I got, I got. You that. got the '70s studio musicians. I'm taking all top 40 of the 2000s. Last thing, the future. What are you taking? Okay, the future. I'm taking um, technology, but um, and that's kind of a vague answer. But my vision of the technology is a way where humans and computers can coexist without you know, computers dominating us and taking over the world. So some element where everything gets easier for us and computers are being used in a way to uplift the human spirit and yeah. also keep us away from them. Mm -hmm. So an ability for a computer to be involved and not involved yeah, and just uplift this sort of dream team that I've put together, you know. I feel like with the capabilities of the future, we can both have the technology. That's exactly what I was gonna say. I'm talking hard drive space even. <laughs> I'll take the hard drive space of the Great. future. I'll take the Wi-Fi. I'll take just the general bandwidth. All of that together. Wireless. Wireless. I'm talking whatever phone you use is gonna be a better camera than what we're using now as professional cameras. Like yep. that sort of thing. All of that wrapped into small devices. The ability to communicate even more deep with people from around the world in a way with less barriers and hopefully less barriers for more people. So it's not just the people that can afford the plane ticket to Beijing can go to Beijing or communicate deeply with somebody who lives back there. An MTV app so you can just <laughs> so watch, I can watch Woodstock every, 99. Exactly. And watch Woodstock. Oh, yeah. Anytime. Just dial it up. There you have it. That's the future. We both created our dream teams. What's yours? Put it in the comments below. Peace. Big thanks to Joey Dosick for hanging out with us today. We'll see you next time. Two, three, four. Oh.